starting a new series we're calling Problematic Passages, because sometimes the passages are problematic. So we're going to deal with some of the, some of the tougher ones, not all of them, but some of the tougher ones. And part of it is just simply, as humans, I don't think we deal with change very well. Some of you, I know, don't deal with change very well. So, yeah, you know, I think Andy was pointing all the way around the world to himself. But, but, but you know, I, I, won't, I won't get into that. Um, so having said that we don't deal with change very well, I just thought I'd let you know of a few changes that are starting uh, this summer. Um, we are entering into what we are calling a partnership with Highlands Church. So what that's going to look like this summer is that Michael's going to come and speak here twice when I'm on holidays in July. The other two messages, the first one will be actually the last of this series, and that will be Pastor Jerry that will be speaking on that one. So I'm, I'm excited to tune in online and find out what he's, got, what he's going to say about this. And then Michael will come for the next two weeks, and then Greg will finish off the summer portion um, the week before Party the Point. When I get back from holidays, I will be spending three weeks preaching at Highlands. So I will do the Highlands and here bit. So I won't be here when you get here in the morning. I'll be over at, at Highlands, but I will come in and then I'll, I'll, be, I'll be with you for the rest of the day. So that's, I'm going to do three over at Highlands. Michael's doing two here. Um, besides that, we are going to be having guests for our July 2nd service and the party at the point, August 13th. Highlands is coming here for both of those services. So there'll be a few faces you haven't maybe seen for a while or haven't ever seen as they come over to share that with us. So just so you know, for those who don't like change, you've got it's a little bit of change coming over the, over the summer. I've always thought that I do well with change, but... I also have some very clear memories of when I didn't deal well with change. The first one, the first time when I didn't deal very well with change, you have to understand I was four years old. It was my fourth birthday, and my fourth birthday was the worst birthday up until that point. I know, there was a lot to compare with, but you know, the fourth was the worst and part of the problem was is that my, my free childhood was ending, and I knew it. When I turned five, I was going to have to go to kindergarten, and I did not want to go. So that, when I turned four, that was just a reminder that this was it. This was the last year of being able to do whatever I wanted during the day because when I hit five, I was going to have to go to kindergarten. And, and I can still remember that birthday. Just that's all I was thinking about. I got my first two-wheel bike in my fourth birthday. And um, that helped me, you know, a little bit. It helped me be, get a little freedom. But uh, I was still upset that I was going to have to go to kindergarten in a year. And that my childhood was basically done. And I was, not, I was not ready yet. At four years old, I just wasn't ready yet. So that was quite a catastrophic birth, a birthday for me. The next moment I didn't do well with change happened actually about eight years later than that, and it was similar. Um, when I was 12 years old, I graduated from elementary school, grade six, which meant I had to go to junior high school the next year, which was a mile away. You have to understand, my, my, my elementary school was like two houses and I was in the yard. I mean, it was, it was close. I could get up and eat breakfast and be out the door and get to school in no time. I was going to have to walk a mile to junior high. And I don't know whether you realize this or not, but junior high students don't get recess. And this was a real huge thing for me because like, I kind of lived for recess. And so I can remember that summer, I, I made the decision that I was not going to have fun that summer because I wanted the summer to take as long as possible. 
And when you're not having fun, it seems to go really slow. And that's what I wanted, because I did not want to go to junior high school. Yeah, I know. It doesn't sound like much now, but when you're four years old or 12 years old, these are big problems. And they were ones that I, that I struggled with. Change, we don't do it very well. And this morning we're going to start talk, we're going to start our problematic passages with a, a psalm that was written in the midst of change. In this case, actually, it was written in the midst of uh, an exile, a, a change of home from Judah to Babylon. And the people had been taken, uprooted from their homes, and they had been forced to go someplace that they didn't want to go to. And all of those fears, all of that uncomfortable feeling was coming to the top. They didn't understand. They didn't, they didn't want to live in Babylon. They, they wanted to live in Judah, where they had been living, where their parents lived, where their grandparents and the great-grandparents. They wanted to be home, but they were being forced to go somewhere else. And the psalm we're going to look at is, is 137, and you probably know a little bit of the psalm, even if you've never, ever read the Bible, because Boney M. made it a hit in the late 70s. By the river of Babylon. I think I got the words up here. Yeah, there we are. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and there we wept when we remembered Zion. That is the opening lines, basically, to Psalm 137. Boney M. sang it in the late 70s and all of us people who lived back then kind of sang it with them. Had a bit of a beat to it. Um, a few years ago, or actually many years ago now, decades ago, a few of us had the privilege of being in a uh, production of Godspell. Nelda, me, Greg, and Alyssa were part of that production. And there's a song in Godspell that is also based on, one thir- on Psalm 137. Just so you know, we, 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 we were part of this production in Godspell, and then some of us, you know, our, our heads got fairly big, you know. Um, Nelda was flying out to see her sister, and she went to the airport, and she was waiting to board this plane, and this couple comes up to her and says, weren't you in that production of Godspell? You know, it's, it, 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 it's, it was our moment in, in, of fame, you know. She got to say, yes, I was. <laughs> to want my autograph. <laughs> Um, The song in in Godspell is based on 137. It's called On the Willows. And it's, On on the willows there we hung up our lyres. For our captives there required of us a song. And our tormentors mirth saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. Sing Sing us one of the songs of Zion. But how can we sing? Sing the Lord's song in a foreign land. God, how... Can we sing when I'm not where I want to be? When things are dark and they are almost hopeless, God, where does the the song come from? Um, Rabbis look at Psalm 137 and they argue that it was probably, or they think, it was written by Jeremiah. Jeremiah. Um, I hate to disagree with smart people, but I'm not sure they're right. Jeremiah would not have been my first guess. I know that he's the weeping prophet, and this is definitely a weeping psalm. But my guess would have been Ezekiel. Number one, Ezekiel was in Babylon. He was there. He saw the people. Jeremiah was in Jerusalem and then into Egypt. So, it makes more sense to me that Ezekiel wrote it. But beyond that, in Ezekiel 3, we have this passage. The Spirit then lifted me up and took me away. And I went in bitterness and in anger of my spirit with the strong hand of the Lord on me. I came to the exiles who lived at Tel Aviv near the Kabar River. And there where they were living, I sat among them for seven days deeply 
distressed. To me, that really picks up this by the rivers of Babylon. We have a struggle with it because of the place, Tel Aviv. And you're probably going, Tel Aviv is in Israel. Tel Aviv is a very modern name. The city that we know of know of as Tel Aviv on the coast in Israel would have been Jaffa back then. And so I think maybe it would be better to go back to what the Hebrew says, which is, I came to the exiles who lived at Tel Aviv, near the Kabar River. And there where they were living, I sat among them for seven days, deeply distressed. Tel Aviv, we think, was just south of Babylon. So this was this town that was just in the south of, of Babylon by this kabar. It was actually a canal. And Ezekiel says, I was taken to this, to this water and I was angry and I was deeply distressed. Let me, I'm going to read Ezekiel 3.14 once, one more time. But this time I'm going to let it carry right into Psalm 137. I came to the exiles who lived at Tel Abib near to the Kabar River. And there, where they were living, I sat among them for seven days, deeply distressed. By the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. There on the poplars, we hung our harps. For there, our our captors asked us for songs. (coughs) Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? If you're trying to keep notes, just write down the importance of the song. The importance of the song. I actually, I I drive my, my family nuts because everything that they do reminds me of a song. And I'm not afraid to sing it. And so they, you know, roll their eyes. Oh, Dad. You know, it'll happen, I'm sure, today at some point. Somebody will do something, and I'll start singing some song from the 70s, you know, that it reminds me of. Songs are important. They're very important. But I've also been in the place where the song... The song didn't, I couldn't sing. The music didn't make sense to me. The song's important, but sometimes if we're not emotionally there, there's just nothing we want to listen to, or at least that's the way that I felt. There's a story in the Old Testament about, um, during the reign of actually King Jehoshaphat where he has three armies that are gathering against him. Three armies are, are, are getting ready to, to defeat Jerusalem. The army of Ammon, the army of Moab, and the men from the mountain region of Seir had all gathered to fight against Judah. And Judah's not sure what to do, and Jehoshaphat's not sure what to do. So he, he goes and inquires of, of the prophet and says, what should I do? And the prophet replies, don't worry, God's got this under control. You don't have to sweat this. This one is is not going to turn bad for you. God knows what he's doing. You can just relax. And then something very strange happens. Let me read it. Early in the morning, they left for the desert of Tekoa. And as they set out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Listen to me, Judah and people of Jerusalem. Have faith in the Lord your God, and you will be upheld. Have faith in his prophets, and you will be successful. After consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness as they went out at the head of the army, saying, Give thanks to the Lord, for his love endures forever. You got that scene? 
army is, 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 is starting to gather to march out to meet these three armies that are coming for them. They've got their weapons, they've got their swords, they've got their shields, and Jehoshaphat says, this is what we're going to do. We're going to set Greg and his worship band right there. No, no weapons, just guitars and drums. And Over here, Chris Tomlin and his band with their instruments. Matt and you know, Beth Redman over here with their instruments. The Gaithers maybe back over there. Uh, Oak Ridge Boys, no, I guess they're not even around anymore. Uh, but we're, we're going to set them just over here. And they are going to sing. They're going to march out and sing as we approach the armies. I mean, if this was Star Trek, you'd probably have them in red, red shirts, you know? And if you don't get that joke, find somebody who, who understands Star Trek. But, you know, this is the cannon fodder. These are the people that are going to die because they're not, carrying inst- they're, not, they're not carrying weapons. They're just carrying their instruments. And they're singing, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. It's not even a deep theological song. It's, you know, just give thanks to God as we march out. Listen to the way the story ends. As they began to sing and praise, the Lord set amb- ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, who were invading Judah, and they were defeated. The Ammonites and the Moabites rose up against the men from Mount Seir to destroy and annihilate them. After they finished slaughtering the men from Seir, they helped to destroy one another. And when the men of Judah came to the place that overlooks the desert, okay, so again, set up the scene. As the men, as the men of Judah came to the place that overlooks the desert, that means as these worship leaders and instrumentalists get to the top of the hill, singing, give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. Just as they get to the top of that hill, when the men of Judah came to the place that overlooks the desert and place and looked toward the vast army, they saw only dead bodies lying on the ground and no one escaped. The song, the power of just the song that kept people moving. And when they got to the top of this hill singing Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. They looked out and they found the battle was already finished. It was done. God had given them a song. And it was important. The psalm continues. If I forget you, Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its skill. May my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I do not remember you, if I do not, oh, sorry, if I do not remember you, if I do not consider Jerusalem my highest joy. The next blank is just simply a song of remembering. I need to remember God. I need to sing a song that reminds me of who you are, even in the darkest moments. I, I am convinced that we can psych ourselves up to be able to handle any obstacle when the sun's in the sky. But it seems that once the sun dips down below the horizon, once it starts to get dark, then everything seems to be overwhelming on us. It's too big. And we need to remind ourselves of who God is. Back in the 1600s. There was uh, during the, ra- the reign of Louis the Fourteenth in France. There was a a man that was in prison. His name was Eustache Dage. But there was a problem with this man. Number one, they didn't know what crime. It never. There's no documents that tell us what 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 crime he might have committed. The second thing was that his name, Eustace Dage, was written in in different handwriting. It had been added later. And nobody's really sure who this guy was. 
In fact, part of the reason why nobody was ever sure who this guy was was because he was forced to wear a black mask everywhere he went so that you couldn't see his face. Voltaire is the one that started the rumor that it, that it was the man in the iron mask, but he, I think he was wrong. It was just a black mask. But he was hidden. He spent 38 years in jail hidden away from everybody, and there he would die. And of course, people have made lots of guesses at who this person might have been. Voltaire was convinced that he was the older, illegitimate brother of King Louis XIV. And that seems to be where most people land when they're considering the the mystery of the man in the Iron Mask. He was always accompanied by two musketeers, and if he was ever to start taking the mask off, they were ordered to just kill him. Alexandre Dumas, in his The Three Musketeers books, comes on to a different solution. He says that maybe this man was the identical twin brother of Louis XIV. Maybe the rightful heir to the throne. But nobody knew. They kept him masked, and nobody ever knew who he was. I'm convinced that God is with us. He's here. He's with us when we're at home. He's with us wherever we go. He's with us at the noonday sun, and he's with us in the darkness. He is always with us. But the question becomes, do we recognize who he is? Do we recognize him as God? Do we remember the things that he has done? I'm convinced that our jobs, we we have a choice. We can complain about what we do. Or we can thank God that he has given us something to do. Our relationships, our marriages, we can complain about what our spouse does, all the things that we don't like. Or we can thank God for the relationship that he has given to us. We can recognize that God is in the relationship. It's our choice. We can do one or the other. And sometimes we need to be reminded that God is still on the throne, that he still walks with us, that he is still deeply interested in our lives. Louis Giglio, uh, one of the founders of the Passion Movement, a pastor in Georgia, I believe, um, tells a story. He lost his father when he was quite young. Um, well, he was a young adult anyways. And he remembers his dad dying in the hospital. He was running a fever. He had cooling blankets on him. And, and Louis was allowed to go and visit his father three times a day, five minutes each visit. And so he, re- he has these memories of himself walking into the hospital room three times a day for these five minutes to see dad. And dad was not conscious. He was not able to talk back. And Louis says, I I didn't know what to do. And then it just kind of hit me that even in these moments I could sing. So he picked a song and he sang it every time that he went for those five minutes to see his dad. Jesus, name above all names, beautiful Savior, glorious Lord, Emmanuel, God is with us, blessed Redeemer, living Word. Just a reminder of who God was. In the midst of the darkness, in the midst of everything that was going on in this hospital room. 
you are still here. And you still care. The song reminds us. It helps us to emotionally connect with the God who is with us, even in our darkest moments. I can't imagine that there was a darker moment for the Jews than when they were taken out of their homes and forced to go live in Babylon a, under a king that they did not know, away from everything that they did know, away from the temple that they had been brought up, brought up by, now going down to a river that they did not recognize. And yet, God was still there. And now for the problematic part of Psalm 137. Remember, Lord, what the Edomites did on the day that Jerusalem fell. Tear it down, they cried. Tear it down to its foundation. Daughter Babylon, doomed to destruction, happy is the one who repays you according to what you have done to us. Happy is the one who seizes your infants and dashes them against the rocks when the darkness defeats the song. You ever felt like that? I have. Those moments of darkness and somebody has done something against us and all you want to do is say, God's going to get you. God will get you for this. And the darkness defeats the, the song. I was listening a while ago to a guy named Peter Rawlins. He's an Irish theologian, philosopher. Um, says a lot of surprising things. But one thing he talks about, he says, is that every good band has to have a breakup song. He said, if, if you're going to, you know, sing about emotions, you've got to have a breakup song. And then he makes this surprising comment. Every good worship team needs a breakup song. And I'm going, huh, what's our breakup song? <laughs> Not sure. I'll have, to, I'll, have to, I'll have to put some more thought into that. But he said, yeah, every worship team needs a breakup song. If you're going to understand the positive emotions, you've got to have something that helps you in the depths of the darkness. Something that reminds you of what's going on. There are two different types of passages in the Bible. The, pass the, the Bible doesn't pull punches on us. It, it doesn't make everything beautiful in it. It tells us a lot about our human reactions, even sometimes when they are negative. So we sometimes have to understand that there are prescriptive passages, passages that say, go and do this. Go and, and be like this. Follow these suggestions. But there are also descriptive passages that just simply describe where the Bible characters are, what's happening in their life. This is descriptive. It's about a people who have been pulled out of Babylon, or out of Judah, taken someplace where they didn't want to be. And the emotions and everything else started get, getting to them. The darkness has overwhelmed them, and they cry out with this negative thought. Tear it down. Babylon doomed for destruction. Babylon, by the way, was doomed for destruction. But sometimes the emotions get the better of us. Sometimes we say things that we know we probably shouldn't say. And I think part of this passage is the psalmist saying things that he probably knows he shouldn't say that are not true. God was not going to dash the infants on the rocks. 
not what he wanted. But they had lost the song. The, the darkness had defeated the song. Several, again, 20 years, I think it was 20 years ago, 21 years ago, I was asked to write a song for a um, conference, a solo, a singles conference. And so they gave me a, a scripture verse to write that was going to be their theme, and they wanted the song to go along with this theme. And I remember they gave me the, the scripture verse was Jeremiah twenty nine eleven. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you. And it is a passage that to today I still think is one of the most misused passages in the Bible. We make it so that God will come now to save us. Where in what Jeremiah was telling them was, he's got a plan for you, but he's going to leave you in Babylon. He's going to leave you in Babylon for 70 years. You're going to die in Babylon. Your children might die in, in Babylon. Your, great grand, your, your grandchildren might come back to Judah. But he still has a plan. No matter where you are, no matter what you're doing, no matter what the, the negative issue is, no matter how much the darkness has come crashing, he still has a plan for you. And I think Jeremiah 29, 11 does kind of connect with our passage this morning. By the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. Jeremiah, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. I'm not going to let the darkness win. I'm going to give you a song in the night. Remember the story of Paul in prison? The earthquake comes, and what are they doing? They're sitting in prison, chained to the walls, singing praises to their God. Because he is the God who comes and gives us songs in the night. And we have a choice as his people. We can let that song infiltrate who we are, penetrate the darkness that's keeping us down. Or we can say, my heart's got no reason to sing at this point, and I don't want to know the song. And I think God cheers for us to learn the song, even in the depths. I don't know what's going on in your life this morning. You don't know what's going on in my life. But I'm convinced that wherever you are, wherever I am, God still wants to give us a song that reminds us of all that he is and of his presence right here in our lives with what's going on right now. He's not oblivious to what you are going through right now. He knows. He knows you. He knows how you're feeling. He knows your fears, your worries. And he's saying, listen, I want to give you a song. If you'll just take it from me. I want to read Ezekiel again. Then the Spirit lifted me up and took me away. And when in bitterness and in anger of my spirit, with the strong hand of the Lord on me, I came to the exiles who lived in Tel Aviv, near the Kabar River. And there where they were living, I sat among them for seven days, deeply distressed. I lived in the darkness that they were living in, deeply distressed. And if I can just kind of add a little bit into this passage, taking from the testimony of Paul and Peter, it might be just this. And then God gave me a song. The darkness was heavy, but then God gave me a song. Put a song on my lips. He put his word in my heart. 
so that I, even I, could get through the darkness. The only way that the song overcomes the darkness is if we let it. Or the darkness overcomes the song is if we let it. The song naturally wants to overcome the darkness, no matter what that darkness is that we are in. Let me pray. Father, I thank you. Even for problematic passages. I thank you for your song that comes, that ministers to us even in our worst times. We got that bad health report we were hoping not to get. We have anxiety because there are things going on in our lives that, that we can't handle. God, I just ask, I pray for each one of us that in those times you would just give us your song. Help us to remind you of everything that you are. And help us to praise your name. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Before the worship team takes over, I just wanted to add something to what I said. Um, most of you know my mother is not well. She's suffering from dementia, struggles with memory, doesn't want to be where she is. But for as long as I can remember, my mother has also had a practice. When things were overwhelming her, especially at night, when she was in bed and trying to go to sleep and everything was too much, she sings. She sings the song of her Savior. She sings the song of her God. She lays in that bed and just lifts up her voice in song. Because even in the darkness, God can give us a song. I'm proud.